And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some additional benefits for concurrency. In particular, we're going to talk first about how concurrency can help improve responsiveness in Android, although the topic is broader than that. OK, so let's first talk about some of the impediments to leveraging hardware parallelism. So if you look back in the previous part, I talked about how we have all this multi-core hardware available, and we have all these new, newer software layers, operating systems, middleware, and so on that are multi-threaded. And so at some level, it looks like this is great. We have an abundance of parallelism. What's the issue? Let's just use it all. But as always, it's, it's not always that simple, right? So there's some things that you have to, to know further about in order to be able to make your programs run faster if they're running in a multi-core environment. So here are some of the impediments. Uh, despite all the improvements in the hardware, there's still things you have to be aware of to, to leverage the parallelism. One of the, one of the limitations is the fact that not every computing platform supports the latest hardware advances. So there's plenty of old computing devices out there, older desktops, older laptops, older smartphones, older tablets, and so on, that only have a single core, which means that the available parallelism is, is restricted. There's sometimes ways of being able to make it even a single core computer do things in parallel if you have support for stuff like direct memory access and so on. But in general, if you're stuck with an older device, then parallelism is not going to be easy to extract from it, right? Because there's only one thing that's uh, able to go on in general. So that's one of the limitations, right? It's not always the case that we have all the greatest and latest stuff. Moreover, even if you do have a multi-core machine or a multi-core mobile device, it's sometimes the case that it's hard to fully leverage parallelism due to various impediments that are thrown in our way by various software layers. And let's talk about some of those. So one issue, of course, is that a lot of older code, which we call legacy code, isn't designed to be thread safe. So legacy code is typically code that was written back in, in previous generations of hardware and software. And so it's often single threaded because multi-threading hasn't been around that long. And more to the point, people haven't really understood how to use multi-threading until recently. So here's one example. A lot of older code will have globally visible objects or global variables or public static variables or objects if you're in Java that are not protected by locks. And as a result, if you try to access them from multiple threads, you'll incur what's known as race conditions. And race conditions are basically problems that occur when a program depends on the sequence or the timing of its threads in order to operate properly. So the minute you have more than one thread, and the minute that thread can run truly in parallel, as opposed to being time sliced back and forth in a more sort of faux parallelism-like way, then you have the issue that there may be global objects that are accessed by multiple threads, and they'll be corrupted. Their state will be corrupted because the threads will read and write from them simultaneously. And we'll talk a little bit later about the issues of atomicity and visibility and ordering and so on. Those are really the deeper technical reasons why this is a problem. But for right now, just imagine that you've got something that's shared amongst a number of people, like, I don't know, a cake or something. And if multiple people try to grab it at the same time, they'll rip it to shreds, right? Each person will end up with a piece of the cake when they really want the whole cake, not just a piece of it. So we'll come back and talk about that. But that's one of the problems with legacy code, very common problem. It wasn't designed to be thread safe. And therefore, when you use it in a multi-thread environment, the code has race conditions, which are really bad. And they're hard to track down. They're corrupting the data. Another issue, another impediment, is that GUI toolkits weren't necessarily designed to be thread safe. In fact, almost every GUI framework I'm aware of, especially in widespread use, is not thread safe by design. In other words, they designed it to be the case that only a single thread of control, typically a designated thread, like the main thread or the user interface thread or whatnot, can actually access objects that are part of the GUI toolkit components, like views and dialogues and buttons and edit texts and text views and so on. And there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. Uh, one reason is that by not allowing more than one thread to access these GUI widgets, these GUI controls and components, it eliminates the need to put any locks in the implementation of the GUI toolkit which means that the code is smaller and faster because it doesn't have to be locked, because it can't be used properly 
outside of one well-designated thread of control. So that's one reason. It just makes things easier to write, more optimal, and so on. The second reason is that we often want to avoid requiring application developers to have to understand concurrency unless it's absolutely necessary. So by not allowing concurrency for the user interface stuff, there's a whole pile of applications and a whole class of developers who don't have to think or know much about concurrency. The, the UI people, right? the people who are, who are responsible for the user experience and the cool GUIs and the responsive design and all that stuff. They don't have to really know much about concurrency at all, which is good. So it allows a larger group of people to be able to participate without having to be experts at this black art of concurrency control. In particular, Android only allows the user interface thread to access the GUI components. And if you take a look at this link, it'll explain why that is. So the user interface thread that interacts with the user can access the GUI components, but any background worker threads are not able to access them directly. And that'll actually become important with various assignments that you do in the class. You'll have to understand how to break things up so that some things run in the background and do computations that run a while, and then there's only one thread that's actually interacting with the user interface. Yet another impediment to leveraging hardware parallelism is something that's called Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law is sort of like Moore's law. It's a law, right? And basically, Amdahl's law says the speed up of a program that uses multiprocessors is limited by the sequential portion of the program that can't run in parallel. So what that's saying in plain English is if you have an algorithm that only can do one thing at a time, it doesn't really help to throw dozens or hundreds of cores at the problem because it's really limited to one thing at a time. And in most programs, there are certain parts of the program that cannot run in parallel, often things that are doing stuff like accessing shared state, for example. And therefore, Amdahl's law is saying you can't expect parallelism to solve all your problems if your algorithms are not inherently parallel. Now, the good news is over the past decade or so, as there have been more and more multi-core devices, people are getting better and better at writing the algorithms to take advantage of them. But older algorithms or certain kinds of algorithms in general or certain portions of algorithms are not able to be fully parallelized. So just be aware that you can't just run things in an embarrassingly parallel manner all the time because not every problem decomposes itself into such a uh, map reduce or divide and conquer like manner. So with that as background, now let's talk about using currency to improve responsiveness. How are we going to do this? Well, even if you can't necessarily leverage hardware parallelism for whatever reasons we just talked about, right? Some code might be not thread safe. You may have restrictions on the way that certain code can access the GUI components. You may have Amdahl's law, blah, blah, blah. There are still ways you can improve responsiveness by using concurrency. Even if things aren't necessarily running any faster, the perception, like a magician, is making it appear like it's running faster. And here's one common example. If you've programmed with the Mac, or you've or used the Mac, or you've programmed with Windows, or used Windows, you probably recognize these icons or some variant of them. These are the spinning pinwheel. That's the one on the left-hand side of the screen. That's the Mac weight cursor. And the hourglass is sort of the traditional Windows weight cursor. And what those things are saying is, stuff's taking a while to run. You can't interact with it right now. And that's a really annoying uh, icon to get because it means that you're not able to access the GUI. The GUI is frozen. You can't typically even cancel what you're doing because you can't get access to it. So we don't want that. That's what the red uh, circle with the slash through it means. We don't want to have that. And the way to do this is to use threads to avoid ignoring user input or user interactions while long duration computations or communications are taking place in some background threads. So here's a, a simple example of this. We might allow worker threads to perform some other processing in the background while another thread handles the user input. And so a simple example that you're probably familiar with if you do much, uh, if you need to get money out of an ATM machine, if anybody still uses cash, uh, you typically have an ATM machine where you've got a user interface and part of the interaction is you typing stuff in, right? You put your card in, you type in your PIN number, a screen pops up. You select what you want to do, you want to withdraw, you want to deposit, blah, blah, blah. You want to check your balance and so on. You want to transfer funds. And, and all those menu items are responsive. But keep in mind what's really going on. Back in the background somewhere, there's some kind of communication taking place with 
an actual bank checking to see is your card stolen? Is your PIN number correct? Do you have appropriate funds in your bank account? Blah, 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 right? And so if this wasn't designed in a multi-threaded like way, then your user interface, the, the ATM window, would be blocking while all these long running computations were taking place across the network. But instead, they kind of keep the user interface decoupled from the longer running computations. So you get this responsive, hopefully pretty snappy interaction. And other stuff is taking place in the background. So that's what that diagram is showing. There's some kind of user interface thread that's making the interface with the ATM interactive. And then there's longer running computations that may be blocking in the background. So that's an example of how you could use concurrency to improve perceived response time. Now, it may still take about the same amount of time to do the work, because there may only be one CPU, but we're using the threading mechanism to allow things to run while something else is blocked, waiting for operations to finish that are long duration operations. Now, as long as the software infrastructure supports preemptive multi-threading, even single core hardware can be more responsive. And that's what this diagram kind of shows. Uh, if you have a non-preemptive implementation, this is sort of older operating systems, older middleware, then each task runs to completion. And only when it's finished does it give control back to somebody else. And the problem, as you can see here, is there may be a long delay while you're waiting for something to finish. If you have a preemptive system, then typically there'll be a way for the operating system to automatically preempt every you know, uh, 10 microseconds or, or whatever the periodicity, every 100 microseconds, whatever the context switching time is. Um, it'll switch back and forth. And so each thing gets a chance to run. And typically, the way that stuff works is if, if one thread or one process is going to block for a period of time, then like doing an, a read operation, for example, or a write operation that blocks, that automatically preempts that thread and lets another thread run. So preemptive approaches can give you a more responsive system, even if there's only one core, which is, which is good. Right? That's the benefit of, of a preemptive multitasking system. Yes? Great, great question. So the question is, does the switching that takes place on the preemptive one take place as a result of time? So the answer is yes. So by default, every thread usually gets, every thread that's a so-called time sharing thread gets a chance to run for, let's say, 100 microseconds or something like that. And every 100 microseconds, a, an interrupt occurs, and the operating system you know, <coughs> wrenches control from the thread that's running, suspends it, and then starts another thread. This is assuming we have only one core, right? However, if the thread that's running does a blocking operation, like a blocking read or a blocking write, then it will more rapidly context switch. Because there's no sense in keeping the CPU idle while that thread is blocking. So if something goes to block, then it'll switch right away. If, if something doesn't block on its own accord, then every you know, 100 microseconds or whatever the periodicity is, it'll be automatically preempted. So yeah, that's, that's a great question. Ah, great question. So the question is, what's the overhead of context switching? Yes, it certainly makes it slower. Um, and so there's a trade-off, of course, between making it somewhat slower versus giving systems that are not responsive, right? So, and the other, that's part one. Part two is hardware is getting really fast. Part three is people have been working on optimizing context switching performance and reducing that overhead over you know, decades. So the context switching, while non-zero, isn't really big especially relative to how long you get to run. So context switching might take you know, a microsecond. It probably takes less than that. But it might, if it takes a microsecond, and then you get to run for 100 microseconds, you know, that's, that's a small, it's a 1% or less penalty for that. And the, consequ the, the alternative to that is non-responsive systems. And systems at this point, uh, in, in many cases, you're optimizing for responsiveness, not for total throughput or real-time response. Having said that, if you want real-time response, then there's a different scheduling class that most operating systems support called the real-time scheduling class. And in those environments, once your thread's got its grubby little hands on the, the core, it will not relinquish it until it decides it's good and ready. And so those are non-preemptive. But those, of course, are for real-time systems where there's some really important tasks, like checking the, checking the uh, temperature on the nuclear reactor or whatever that you want to have run on a very precise time frame. But um, and other stuff that's lower priority, oh well, if it waits, it waits. That's sort of the definition of a real-time system. <clears throat>
So most systems today are optimized for this sort of um, interactive response. Now, having said that, if you're running on a server platform, you may want yet a different way of doing things. So a server probably doesn't care as much about swapping, especially if it has lots of cores and lots of threads. So it, an operating system and middleware will give you lots of knobs to turn to control the behavior. Yeah? Yeah, great question. So the question is, what does it mean to block? Right? So think about all the things in your life when you have to block. Right? So um, let's say that you're, you're working on a team, and you're building one part of some project, and you have to depend on other people to provide you the other parts. Right? So let's say you're, you're writing a user interface, and someone else has to provide the database. And the people who are doing the database part haven't finished yet. And now you come to the part of the project where you need the results from the database. So you, as a human being, would have to block you know, or or something, uh, you probably wouldn't block and just like sleep until they're done. But you would, you would relinquish that operation and go off and do something else, right? Because you wouldn't wait. So that's, that's the concept of blocking. In a computing environment, when you go to read from a queue or from a file or from a network, and for whatever reason, the thing you're trying to get isn't ready yet, right? Because maybe the server hasn't sent the next chunk, or maybe the uh, block you're asking for on the disk is off in some, you know, on a tape farm somewhere, so it's going to take a while to get access to it. Anytime you don't get the result back almost instantaneously, those are called blocking operations. And the operating system recognizes that, and it'll automatically arrange to preempt the thread that's trying to block, put it to sleep, run another thread, and then when that thread is finished, or whenever whatever it's waiting on is done, it'll then at some point come along and wake it back up again and give it control. We're going to talk very shortly about the life cycle of a thread, and I'll go through all the states, and you'll see exactly when blocking occurs. Blocking typically occurs on I.O., and blocking also typically occurs on synchronizers. We'll talk about them later, like mutexes and semaphores and condition objects and all this kind of good stuff. So we'll talk about all those things. Good questions. Any other, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So the question here is uh, a, lot of, a lot of CPUs have what are called hyper-threading or virtual cores. They don't actually have, they're, they're designed in a way where you don't actually have a physically separate core the way you would if it was a pure multi-core solution. It, it depends largely on the kinds of operations that you're doing. So some operations, a virtual core will give you a speed up that's almost <clears throat> equivalent to a regular core. And in those cases, the virtual cores would be treated as regular cores from the purpose of scheduling and time slicing and giving things to run. But not all operations will be able to run concurrently. So typically, I think the, the trade-off is between uh, comp compute bound operations versus IO bound operations. And so I, I think I'd have to go back and look, and it depends on what processor you have. But oftentimes, the compute-bound operations may be able to run concurrently. But whenever you do I.O., it's sharing something. And so in that particular case, they have to wait for that shared thing. So there may be a bit more contention. That's what we used to have before multi-core was popular, was this hyper-threaded model, which I think is a virtual core-like approach. Great. Other, other questions? OK. So continuing on. Android, and specifically Android's concurrency frameworks, define features and idioms that can be used to help ensure and improve responsiveness. And the, the basic idea here is to try to avoid the dreaded application not responding, or the ANR exception or dialogue. In Android, if you let something run for too long in the UI thread, where too long is like more than three to five seconds, the dreaded ANR dialog pops up and it says, this application is non-responsive. Do you want to continue or waiting, or do you want to shut it down? Right, so that's the ANR stuff. <clears throat> and you'll find out when you do some of the assignments here that if you don't do your assignments properly, then you'll get these dialogs popping up and your behavior of your program will be very slow. So what Android allows you to do is it allows you to have the user interface thread or the UI thread interact responsively with the user. And so the user interface thread is always doing operations, or should always be doing operations, that don't block for anything more than a few seconds. Even blocking for a few seconds is typically too long. You don't want it to block at all, as a, as a matter of course. And so the user interface is for interacting with the user. And then there's some worker threads that run in the background 
And these are what are used for the longer duration computations. And these worker threads can block on I.O. or synchronizers or computations or whatever they're doing. They can run for a long period of time. And those, of course, get handled by the threading scheduler we were just talking about that does the preemption and so on. And those guys can block. They can do whatever they want. And when they're done, as we'll see later, they have to feed the results back to the user interface thread. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. And the way it works under the hood, as we'll see later, is it uses this message queue, which is what I'm showing here in this slide. So when the background threads are done, they post or send a runnable or a message or whatnot to the message queue. And then that message is then delivered up to the UI thread. And that's where the processing of the UI stuff gets done. Philip. Yeah, uh, a thread is, ba uh, the question is, what is a thread? So a thread is essentially a unit of computation that will process a stream of instructions within the context of a process. So think of the, the thread as something that can do computations and think of it running inside or being contained within a process. And the process is the unit of resource allocation and protection. And the thread is the thing that does the work. So to give you a couple of metaphors, you know, think about the, think about the process as like an office or a classroom. right? It's the unit of protection and resource allocation. You, you, can, get, uh, you can get a tape dispenser or uh, magic markers or whatever. That's, those are the resources you have. right? And the threads are us, people, doing things. And there can be more than one of us inside of a room or inside of an office doing our work. And so the threads are what's actually doing the, the work. They're running the instruction code. And they run in the context of a, of a process. And we'll talk a lot more about threads and processes here shortly. But that's the, the Cliff Notes version. OK, any other questions? All right, so that's the end of this part. We're now going to talk about the next part of the lesson on motivations for and benefits of concurrency in Android. This lesson will focus on how can concurrency can help improve program structure? And this is the, perhaps the less intuitive reason why we would use concurrency than improving performance, which is kind of obvious because you want to take advantage of all those cores, and improving responsiveness by not blocking user input. This one is not quite so straightforward. So to understand why this is even relevant, we have to first give a real short overview of so-called event-driven programs. So many software programs, in fact, older programs on operating systems that lacked multi-threading, like Windows, early versions of Windows, early versions of Mac OS, early versions of Unix, and so on, have typically used event-driven programming. So what does it mean to be event-driven programming? Well, it means that the program flow is guided by events. And there's all kinds of different sorts of events. Sometimes the events are fairly coarse grain, like the ones we see here, which come from Android, where we have events that are called back via so-called hook methods that are dispatched by Android and its activity framework when an activity is created, when it's started, when it's resumed, when it's paused, when it's stopped, when it's destroyed, and so on. And so in a sense, those are events. And your program's driven by these callbacks that indicate something is occurring. Um, places where events occur are often user interface actions, like pressing buttons or adding text into an edit text various I.O. that occurs from sensors, like GPS readings as you're driving around with your, your Google uh, navigation system turned on, messages that are received from other programs, perhaps running in other processes or running in other, other uh, parts of the network, like in a web server somewhere, and so on and so forth. So these are examples of the kinds of events we typically deal with at a, at a finer level of granularity. Here's a very simple example. We might end up with some kind of a button in an Android UI. And we're going to go ahead and set a click listener. You see button.setOnClickListener. And we make ourselves a click listener here. This is using what's called an anonymous inner class instance. We'll talk about that later. And when the user clicks or presses the uh, virtual button on the, on the device, then that will trigger this on-click callback. And there's lots of layers of software going on, of course, under the hood to make that happen. But that's how you get actions occurring. So those are what are called event-driven programs. And they're typically implemented by having these event handlers with methods that have stuff like on, on click, on start, on pause, on destroy. So those are hook methods that are called back by some kind of event dispatcher framework. 
Event-driven programming is particularly common in GUIs that perform actions in response to user input, like we just saw, right? So imagine a hypothetical world where we have a single-threaded <coughs> program, and it's written in Android. And in this case, we're going to have the user interface thread that'll process all the user-facing events. And that's actually kind of the way it works in Android. You have a user interface thread with a means of being able to process events that show up in its message queue. And we'll talk more about that. So that's very common. However, there are limitations with programs that are purely event-driven, where nothing else matters except events. Event-driven programming can be hard to understand, or maybe a better way to put it is software developed using entirely or purely event-driven programming techniques can be hard to understand for certain types of applications. For applications that are entirely event-driven and are just you know, responding to clicks and don't have to ever block, they work pretty well with event-driven techniques. But not everything works that way. So let's imagine, for sake of argument, that we have an app that we will use to download and display images from remote web servers. And you'll actually see such an app. We'll look at the implementation of a number of different variants of this throughout the course. So here's the app. You, you have a user interface for adding a link that you want to download. You click the download button. It starts to download. And then at some point, uh, an image pops up. And that was me in 1981, I think. I had a lot more hair back then. I was at a, a place this weekend where they had a, a wall of, you know, uh, the wall of fame of mullets. They had all these people with mullets. So that's, that's my wall of fame with mullets picture. So if you were to write such a program that's purely event driven, then what you would do is you'd have to make sure you avoided starvation and the dreaded application not responding error dialog by not allowing these long duration operations, in other words, the ones that are downloading the, the image, from occurring in the user interface thread. So that's the goal. We're going to try to, I'm going to try to sketch for you in a, a sort of pseudocode PowerPoint-like manner how you might write a program that used purely event-driven techniques to download an image. And of course, there's just going to be a single thread, the UI thread, and let's assume there's only one core to make it real simple. So what we would do, if you want to do a long duration operation, what's an example of a long duration operation? Downloading a big image, right? So we can't block anywhere waiting for the entire image to download. So instead, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to run this thing asynchronously by posting a message or messages and sticking them in the message queue. For example, we could put a message in the message queue that says, please read a chunk of the image file that's stored at this URL. And that, that under the hood will use something called a socket, which is an interprocess communication mechanism that goes across networks. And so we're going to go ahead and say to some you know, reusable piece of code that's part of the infrastructure, the, the hypothetical infrastructure here, please read me the first chunk of data without blocking. So let's imagine, for sake of argument, the file is you know, several megabytes in size, and we can read you know, 4K chunks or so at a time. So it'll post a message that says, please read me a chunk. That, me that message will go in the queue. Somebody will handle it. It'll go ahead and request asynchronously reading that message. And then when that chunk is received, it will show up as a message that will get back in the user interface thread. And the user interface thread will say, aha, I've got a chunk. That's great. And so what will happen in this case with the example is when we get back the results of the chunk, we will take that, those results and we'll stick them into a, an ever-growing buffer of chunks that we are going to be composing together to make the complete message. And the thing to remember here in this model where we never can block, this process will occur over and over and over and over again until we finally download the entire image. And the, the famous uh, phrase is lather, rinse, repeat, right? So it's like the way you're supposed to wash your hair. You, <clears throat> you get it wet, you lather, you rinse, you repeat until your hair is clean. Actually, I'm not quite sure why you would do this over and over again, because your hair would probably be like straw by the time you got done with it. But that's the, uh, that's the shampoo model. And you can actually find a Wikipedia page that uses this as an example. So this basically means keep doing this over and over and over again until the entire file is downloaded. Now, the issue with this, and, and I don't show you the code. And the reason I don't show you the code is that Android doesn't work this way. There's actually no way to do it like this, for reasons we'll see in a second. The problem with it, and the reason why it's not in there, is that to do it this way would have a disconnect in both time and space between the invocation of an operation, get me the next chunk, and when the result showed up, here's the chunk. 
So there's a disconnect. These occur at different points in time. And they occur literally in different parts of your program. If you were to take a look at the code, there'd be one part that would start the call. Then later on, you'd see another piece of the code that would handle the result. And so if you looked at your code, you'd be a little bit mystified. How does this all work together? What's, what's the flow of control? You can't take a look and see them all easily connected together. So poorly structured software that uses events often leads to spaghetti code or a big ball of mud. And if you want to amuse yourself, take a look at these references. They're both great references talking about why spaghetti code is a big deal and why a big ball of mud is a bad thing to have. This kind of code is hard to understand in general because there's little or no structure or linear flow of control to guide developers. Right? Pieces are disconnected. You're trying to figure out what's going on. As we'll see in a second, you make a small change to one part. It breaks everything else. right? And if you have single-threaded programs that are driven by events, which is typically what you have to do if there's only one thread of control, then it can obscure the flow of control in time and space. And this example, this sort of cartoonish example, sort of illustrates that we do step one, and it's in this part of the code. And then we have to go look at some other part of the code, and step two takes place. And that the path from part one to part two isn't entirely clear by looking at the source code. And then step three takes place over here. And then step four takes place over there. Right? So we're bouncing all around in the code. And the key thing to remember is if your code bounces around like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, it's very hard to understand because you have to keep all that stuff in your head. And as you're looking at the source code, you're bouncing between files and different parts of the files. It's really, really easy to make mistakes and keep everything coordinated is hard. And then, of course, the other issue here is if you make any changes anywhere because it's not really clear what the dependencies are, then stuff starts to break. And that becomes a problem. OK, so with that as background, right? the key thing to remember is purely event-driven code is hard to understand, especially when things block or need, need to block in order to do long duration operations. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about how to simplify everything with concurrency. So this is an example where the goal is not necessarily to make things run faster or be more responsive, although that will often come along for the ride. It's to be able to structure the code so it's a little easier to understand. So by multi-threading the code, we can have a more intuitive means often, not always, but often, of structuring our software. And uh, by the way, these images, I, whenever I want to indicate multiple core, I typically use this. And that's because I was trying to find non-copyrighted images to indicate cores. So we have multiple Apple cores. That's by no means a recommendation for using Apple products, but we have Apple cores. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, just to tell you a bit more notation, because you'll see this over and over again, these little gray boxes, those are processes. These funky things in the process are threads. This is the thread symbol. This is the stack of activation records, which are just the functions that are being called as the thread's running. And then this down here is the internal state that's being shared by the threads. So that's, that's what that means. You'll see that a lot. OK, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take operations that need to run for a long time, and we're going to allow them to block synchronously, so they can just wait until they're done, rather than having to split things up into this invocation response, invocation response. And then you get this big ball of mud or this big spaghetti code. And this ends up often, not always, but often leading to a more natural and collaborative control flow. So things can kind of work together a little better. So the part of Android that supports this, there's several pieces. I'm going to talk about one part right now. This is called the hammer framework. Hammer stands for, for handlers, messages, and runnables. And we'll see a code example in the next lesson that talks about how this works. The, uh, the way this works is that the operations that run for a long period of time can block in the background threads. And the operations that have to be responsive to the users, the things that put stuff up on the GUI or get input from the GUI, those don't block. And they run in the user interface thread. And what's cool about this is it actually gives you a hybrid programming model. So parts of it, the user interface thread parts, are event driven. And those lifecycle events we'll talk about, like on pause, on create, on destroy, and so on. Those are event driven. And other things are event driven, like button clicks and so on. But then the parts that run in the background are going to be concurrent, and they can block synchronously. And the nice thing about this is if you do it well and you understand other aspects of the design, which we'll talk about in just a second, you can end up getting rid of spaghetti code because it's not as spaghetti-laden. You can end up with 
less of a big ball of mud, and your solution doesn't bounce all around. Right? So those are the things that are beneficial. Now, to really make this work well, it helps to have knowledge of certain patterns. And I'm just going to mention them here, and we'll come back and talk about them later. But uh, some of the key patterns here are command processor. When you post runnables to handlers in the Hammer framework, that's the command processor pattern. Uh, active object, when you send messages to handlers to the Hammer framework, you're doing a variant of the active object pattern. And the Hammer framework in general, and another framework we'll talk about later called the half sync, half, it's called the async task framework, implements something called the half sync, half async pattern. Don't worry about those terms now. If you're really curious, you could take a look at some of the resources here. But uh, these are things we'll come back to. And when you understand the patterns, and it all makes really good sense, when you understand the source code, then you can figure out how to write code that's better at the end of the day. OK, so that's the end of part four. So this is the final part of this lesson on motivations for and benefits of concurrency in Android. As we will see, I'll show you by showing you code uh, how we can apply concurrency to avoid having this overly complex and tangled event-driven, purely event-driven solution. And we'll use this web, web application I was talking about that downloads images and displays them to demonstrate the key concepts. All right, so you can actually go and get access to this solution here at this link. This is a link in my GitLab, our GitHub repository. And so if you go to that link, you can download all the source code we're about to look at. I'm just going to show you a snippet of it, but it's all there. It's kind of fun. Um, basically, as, you, as you'll see, what it allows you to be able to do is it allows you to be able to download images from a web server in the cloud somewhere. And to do this, it's going to use a Java thread with a runnable implementation. And we'll talk more about threads probably a week from now, because Monday's a holiday. But you'll be able to download these uh, things with a thread, with a runnable. And by doing this, we'll be able to take advantage of multi-core processors if we have them. And the runnable that we'll have is going to specify what the thread should do. So we're going to say, run this code. And this, again, is a little bit of a preview of what we'll talk about in more detail when we talk about threads. But essentially, think of this as a command. And there's a hook method called run. And this is where the code goes to do the downloading. And then we're going to make an instance of this download runnable. And then we're going to go ahead and start a new thread and give that runnable as the code to execute. And we'll talk later about other ways to do this. But that's the basic idea. You make a, run make a runnable. You start, you start a thread and give the runnable as the parameter to download whatever, whatever to the thread. And we'll talk, and we'll talk more about this in a short time. A short time. That's how that's we're going to download it. And then on, that's, on, that's kind of the back end part, the work of the thread part in the background. Then on the front end part, 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 we're going to use the hammer currency currency framework. And we'll again talk about it in much more detail later. In order to, in order to be able to pass, pass the results of the downloading to the user interface thread so we can go ahead and display it. And so, and so the Hammer framework, framework we all will download, download the images in the background, in the background use red, 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 and then, and then display, display the image in, in the UI, UI thread. thread. And what, and what it's actually, it's actually going to do is even cooler than that. that. What this, what this particular app does is the user, user interface, interface thread, 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 which is called back, back, back and on the downloaded and completed, will actually go ahead and create the gallery app, gallery gallery app, which comes pre configured in Android. Android. It'll go ahead and go ahead and say display this latest in the gallery gallery application and match match the Android Android activity management service, service and all the framework frameworks and Android Android. Android. We'll go and we'll find the activity, activity gallery gallery application and display that that image in the gallery gallery app. So that's really 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 great example. Example couple couple loosely bound component interact interact in the Android Android environment. It's really neat. This particular implementation is intentionally effective, effective because it doesn't, it doesn't handle, handle runtime configuration changes. It doesn't handle interrupts, interrupts properly. Proper. That's not the point of this slide. It's to show how to, how to use the hammer framework and thread the downloads down the background. Back. 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 We will talk we will about all those later, probably, probably two weeks from now. From now. And, and we'll have we'll the assignment side of it covered. All right, so uh, just to recap, just recap the purely a better solution we outlined before was not cohesive because there's this disconnect between Invoking stuff and the result, 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 result was complicated and you had to keep track of all that stuff. And the previous lesson explains that, previous, that, that previous part of the lesson explains that. Let's take a look at how, how we can how solve, solve this all effect more. So, if you take a look at the image download app version, you'll see that there's 
a method called download input. The download input is called back when the user presses the download button. This, this, input, this method gets called back automatically. It goes ahead and gets the URL. It prints out a dialog saying the downloading is in process. And then it goes ahead and starts the download at the designated URL that was provided by the user. And that calls start download calls this method. And this will then go ahead and perform the image download. And here's what it does. It goes ahead, as you can see, and it creates this runnable, which is a command, using the command processor pattern. And then it starts a new thread, starts a new worker thread, with that runnable as its parameter. So now we'll talk about this in more detail, but a separate thread of control we created. It's activation record stack will be created. It will start to run, and it will run the run hook method that was defined by this runnable. So this, this run method will execute in this background worker thread. That will then download the image, and this is calling a, a utility class, which will go ahead and download the image from the URL. And once the image is downloaded, and by the way, this will block. This is a blocking call. It's running in its own thread. It's no problem to block, not a problem at all. When it's finished, it will then create a new command, and it will give that command to the run on UI thread method. Run on UI thread, we'll talk about more in detail later, but in a nutshell, it's going to take the command it gets, the runnable, and it's going to stick it on the message queue, and then the UI thread will pull it off the queue and dispatch it. And when it dispatches it, it will call its run method, which we'll call display image, and display image will arrange, in this case, to spawn another activity to display the image, but that's just an implementation detail. The key point is that what it did was it got the result and then got the image displayed by hook or by crook. OK, so those are the steps. Now, these two methods run in different threads. This method runs in the background worker thread. This the download image runs in the background worker thread. Display image runs in the UI thread. And that's the command, right? We're making a command, and we're giving the command to run on the UI thread. And we'll talk about how all this works with the command processor pattern and stuff later. But notice these things run in different threads. So this is the synchronous part that blocks. That's the asynchronous part that doesn't block. And the nice part about this, I mean, it literally look at the code. It's all right there, right? This is the part that blocks. That's the part that doesn't block. And it's easy to see. They're right next to each other. A single look at the code can convince you very quickly, once you know what the heck's going on, that that's what's happening. And so it's not bouncing around, right? The problem with the other code was it bouncing around. There was code up here. There was code down there. Time and space things were different. This code, it connects it together in a more cohesive way. Yes? So it's not like you can see where you have to like actually declare a lock or like that kind of thing. Ah, great question. So the question was, is this like other programming languages where you might have to make a lock? Under the hood, there is, in fact, locking going on. Because under the hood, the Android framework and the activity class is defining a way of being able to take this runnable command and put it on the message queue. And that message queue is properly synchronized. It's just that your application code doesn't have to have the lock. And we'll see that a lot. We'll see that when we start programming with the more Android-centric concurrency models, that the need for synchronization is often greatly reduced because it's being handled by the infrastructure frameworks, the async task framework or the hammer framework, that hide all the details of synchronization from you. And you only have to synchronize if, in fact, you're accessing shared objects that are shared between threads, which are still important, but you don't have to do it when you pass messages around. We'll also see that there are pros and cons of that approach as well. OK, so we're not bouncing around. Much more cohesive. Yes, ma'am? Oh, great question. So the question is, um, what's the lifetime relationship between new threads and methods and so on? And how does this all work? So the, the great news is that in Java, this is all handled by the Java virtual machine. So it keeps track of the lifetime of everything. Unlike non-managed environments like C and C++, where it gets really complicated unless you follow patterns and frameworks. So the way it works in Java, if we go ahead and start this thread, then all other things being equal, this method will return. But that thread will have been started, and it will be its own anonymous object that will be understood and managed by the virtual machine. Now, it's also possible, and, and you'll see examples in other programs that we'll do, where we're, you could have what are called barrier synchronizers, where you could wait for this thread to be done, 
This particular do approach does not do that because, as you can see, this is an anonymous thread object. It's not being stored anywhere. So once it's started, it just runs to, to completion unless, actually, it's just going to run to completion unless you kill the whole process. So that's a great question, though. So no, there's, uh, in, in Java and Android, because it uses Java, you can start threads, the objects or uh, functions you start them in can go away, but it reference counts everything under the hood in a thread safe way, and therefore you don't have to worry about those lifecycle issues. Now, there are issues where you need to get the results of something before you can do anything further, and we'll talk about them, and those are what are known as, as synchronization points. Um, the other thing that I should just mention in passing, because it's pretty wacky, this, these are anonymous commands that are being created. And we'll talk more about how that works. But when you first look at that stuff, you're like, what the heck is going on? If, if you come from a C++ background, this kind of code is a little bit odd to look at at first. But we'll cover that in the next, next lesson, in fact. Now, so this is the way it would look if we do it with Java 7. When we start using Java 8, which we'll cover later as well, then we would be using Lambda expressions. So this is what the code would look like with the Java 8 code. So compare that, right? That's like four lines of code. This is about you know, 12 lines of code. What's happening here is we are using lambda expressions to get rid of all the unnecessary syntax that's otherwise distracting us from the core computation that's taking place. So the way this reads is it says, make a new thread that will run a lambda expression, which is open, close, arrow, open, curly brace. Here's the code for the lambda expression, close, curly brace, paren dot start. So we're making a new thread. We're starting the thread. It's running this code as its lambda expression, as its runnable. It's an anonymous runnable, essentially. And then down here, run on UI thread, we're just saying, you know, display the image for this path name. That's also a lambda. Yeah, this is a lambda, and that's a lambda. And this is the expanded code. And what's really cool with Android Studio is if you write this code, it will come along. It will say to you, would you like me to automatically convert that code into this code? And the, usually you want to say yes. Now, of course, you only want to say yes once you understand what Lambda expressions do. But we'll cover that in more detail. I love the Lambda expressions. They're so concise and so ergonomic, you know, visually ergonomic, and just make life so much easier. OK, so that's the end of that section. In fact, that's the end of the entire lesson. <laughs>